Welcome to the Airgun World podcast, brought to you in association with Crack Shop, the Southwest's premier airgun centre and ranges. You can check out their website at Crack Shop UK. I'm Matt Manning, and with me this week, I've got my good friend and Airgun World magazine contributor, Rich Saunders, and our guest is Matt Ford, who is the boss at Sports Match Scope Mates. Hi, Matt, and welcome to the podcast. Evening. Hello. Yeah, hello. Can you give us a bit of a potted history of the, the sports match uh, business from its inception right through to the, the present day? Uh, yeah, it, it was my father started a company in 1972 and he was a keen um, shooter, primarily air rifle shooter, and um, he couldn't buy scope mounts that he was satisfied with the creep was a big problem in those days because it was all spring guns so there was some very very expensive german mounts on the market and in those days they were japanese not chinese the the, the budget ones and the giant and the japanese ones creeped under recoil and the german ones were very very expensive and were were a bit better but they're very difficult to get hold of so we thought well I make my own. And he was a designer in the motor and motorsport industry, um, designing a lot of wheels, road wheels seem to be his speciality. If anyone's heard of mini light wheels and wolf race wheels, um, they're eight spoke magnesium wheels used by the Ford and um, British Leyland rally minis and things. So he, he had the skills to. To, to to design and make his own mounts. Um, very small scale to start with. It, it was mail order, you know, in 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 air gun world or whether the magazines were around at the time, probably air gun world, it was a mail order, just buy direct from the manufacturer sort of thing, you know, you, you and you receive you know, receive it in 28 days, that kind of thing, you know, you know. Um, and then it sort of grew and grew. They were a good product you know at, at a, a sensible price british made so people like them you know and they and and, and the scopes were developing um, at the time as well so more and more people starting to use scopes so it, the timing was quite good really from that that side of things so then it, it carried on and on from from there and we started to set, you know interest from overseas um and you know for what we're up to today and where where are you based, Matt? And have you always been where you are now? Yeah, always been in Leighton Buzzard, Bedfordshire. Um, the current premises we've been for best part of thirty years. But it started off. He started off in um, from home, and then um, rent um, borrowing a small part of a, a friend's workshop um, that wasn't used, and that's how you start, isn't it? You get going like that until we needed our own premises. And this was 1972, the start of it. And I, and to put it in perspective, I was born in 1971, so <laughs> wasn't involved much at that time. <laughs> and so when did you become involved in it, then, Matt? Um, as soon as I um, school holidays, work experience, and things like that, I'd help out in the factory sort of thing. Yeah, and, and just and then and then I. You know, as soon as I left school, I I started work here, really. And how long have you been kind of running the show, though? Uh, since I was about, it was a a baptism of fire, really. Um, I was about 21, 22, and my father was, was trying to move the business to Wales at the time, but and not here much, and he was toing and froing, and I, and I sort of kind of, got thrown in at the deep end and had to sort of run it because he wasn't here much um so that it was around then so it was a sharp a very steep learning curve you know, to say the least but so matt you, you've mentioned that, that your dad john ford founded sports match but he was also involved in in the the creation of a very important air rifle and, and you know one that's remembered as being quite an influential Airgun. Can can you tell us a bit bit more about that? How how that came to be, and who who was involved with that project? Yeah, that was 
this was about 1985, 86. Um, my, my father was good friends with Gerald Cardew. And I can remember as a child um, visiting Gerald with my father in, in Birmingham and um, a few times. But Ger Gerald had, they, wa they wanted to build an air rifle, that, you know, the bee's knees, ultimate PCP, because it was the pioneering days of, of PCPs, really, in those, those days. And Gerald had a concept um, that, and, and my father put it into a, a gun, if you like. It was a separate, it was rather than um, a regulator or anything like that, the, there was the gun me metered um, air into a totally separate chamber, um, constant volume, constant pressure, and that was your shot every time. So in theory, every shot's exactly the same. And that was all patented and everything, and, and, and they worked together on it. Hence, the, the rifle was called GC, to Gerald Cardew to you know to to to, to nod to Gerald. And have you still got one, Matt? Please tell me if there's yeah, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I I've I've got one, um, and we've got the the original. G, G, it was GC one at the time, the original prototype. Yeah. Does it still shoot? Do you still use it? Yeah, yeah. My my my. my um, I haven't used my one for a little while. Um, but but they they still shoot fine. Yeah, we we still get asked regularly to make them. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. And the we you know we it, it financially it was a disaster because the development costs was huge. And at what point do you stop? Once you spent the first hundred thousand pounds, bear in mind this is within the eighties. You know, if you stop, then you never make a product, so you lose all of it, don't you? But at what point do you stop? So we carried on till it was finished. And the um, and it was when we won won the world field target championships two or three times, you know, in in those days it was a good product, yeah, very, yeah, yeah. I was very... going to say it, it was field target that that was the, the niche that that gun was really meant to excel at, wasn't it? Yeah, field target primarily. We did do some hunting ones, but it had a it had a muzzle flip compensator with slots in. Um, and we, we to make them a bit quieter, we, we did make some without slots, um, but they were still not particularly quiet because it wasn't a proper silencer. But the hunters, some hunters still love them, you know, because of the accuracy, really. So just getting back to, to the mounts, Matt, I've always wondered what, what, what's the process that goes into creating a set of mounts? Is it, you know, I, I've got this image of some little old man on a stool somewhere with a chisel producing them by hand but i'm sure it's a lot more complicated than that yeah just talk it, through the manufacturing process it, it's it, you know it's billets of material that are um chopped to length um and then machined accordingly drilled and tapped and and uh, they they probably they're probably sawn this probably the, the first process cut to length and then on various um op operations some more than others um, depends on the complexity of the mount, but you know, machining operations um, to to finish off. All made in the UK, is that right? Yeah, every, everything in Item Buzzard. Yes, Br British material. Ev everything is totally British. Yeah, we right. don't don't. Yeah, everything is made in house. Yeah, we've always been like that. And th there's an awful lot of dare I say cheap mounts out there, and and I think the trouble is they look exactly the same as really good mounts. You know, they're the same kind of, the material looks the same. They kind of look, all the screws are in the same place and everything. But what, what's the difference between, why should someone buy good quality mount, uh, mounts as opposed to sort of cheap knockoff mounts? Yeah, well, they, they, do, they do look the same um, at arm's length. But if you're, from an engineering point of view, you know, if you have a closer look, the, the finish isn't, as, isn't quite the same. And if you start measuring the whole positions and, and dimensions, that's when it, it, you know, you see the difference, which, you know, some people might not have a problem with that um, or it might not give them a problem. But some people it does give a problem to. Um, and they, you know, they, then they're the ones that, that choose ours. And so, so the, the, and also the material, you know, 
the the material we use is 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 all British made material, and all certified. Each each batch is um, goes through a testing process where they test the strength of it and make sure there's no cracks or anything in it, that sort of thing, you know. And there's different grades of of material as well. We you know we use we use the best grade that that anodizes properly, you know, without sacrificing the finish. Has there been much of a technological development over time for mounts? What what have we sort of seen evolve in terms of the technology? the original models, which are probably the you know the the, the best sellers still, but the, but more and more so we've gone into adjustable mounts, um, which have become surprisingly popular. Increasingly, um, not so much in the UK, but around the world, really long range shooting. You know, it's it, it's necessary to angle the the scope. You know, as well. So that's you know we've gone into adjustable mounts and things. And I, I, I'm assuming that manufacturing technical advancements have, have just made tolerances that much smaller, consistency of manufacturing yeah. that much higher. Yeah, it has. Yeah, they're, they're just, they're, everything's made on CNC machines, which are very, very precise. But you can't rely on that. You still need to. You still need a human eye to 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 pick to use the measuring devices and things to to final check to check everything. You know, and tools wear and things. So you, you know, you you do have to keep, you know, do have to watch them closely. But as long as they watch properly and run properly, everything is within microns. You know, size. And, and do you work closely with with manufact- air gun manufacturers to kind of know what mounting systems are being developed? Um, and- to a degree, some yes, yes, some, and some scope people as well. You know, we we work along with. Um, but but the but the mounts are sort of a a product on their own as well. What kind of issues would people come into if they're using poor quality mounts? What kind of problems manifest with poor quality mounts in your experience? Um, scope creep under recoil more on PC more on spring guns obviously. Um, out of alignment. Um, if the dovetails aren't machined properly, then they can be the mount can be slightly angled on the dovetail, and and also the size of the bore where the, the bore where the scope sits. If that if that's not the right size, scope won't won't seat properly, and and if it's too small, it can damage the scope it, when the top cap's fitted. And I suppose a lot of that's not visible to the naked eye. No, 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 not really, no, no, not necessarily, it's a long way out. Well, Rich and I can certainly vouch for the quality of sports scope mates because we've been using them for decades and and anybody that watches the Airgun Show will will see us using them very frequently for our hunting exploits on there. Now, we've sort of touched on product development a little bit and in many cases optics are changing Quite rapidly these days, a lot of people are moving over to digital optics. Now, some of those have got uh, 30 millimeter tubes. Others come with their own specific mount, which is often geared towards a Picatinny type rail. Would Sports Match ever sort of move into developing mounts specifically for these new digital optics or, or maybe adapters to convert them for dovetail? Um we have done in the past not for some time but we have done previously but we not in recent times we haven't but but it's it's always something that we'd consider and, and keep an eye on keep an eye on the mark and if there's enough interest we certainly would but there's there's nothing um you know planned just at the moment but we but as i say we have done it but not for probably 30 years we have done that before when when the, uh, maybe 20 years when early night vision scopes came coming out from the states only with Picatinny mounts on, we 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 did did do a couple of adapt. You unscrew the Picatinny mount and screw the dovetail one on, which most people use now. But mind you, these days it's got just as much Picatinny probably, isn't it? So you know, so maybe maybe yeah. And you don't just make mounts for civilian use, do you? Are you able to tell us about any of the military type projects that you've got ongoing, or is that confidential? Um, bit, bits and pieces. The 
we've done a bit, um, a fair bit with bomb disposal robots, which was quite interesting. That was um, a very an unsubtle bomb disposal robot that had a Benelli 12 gauge shotgun mounted to it with a laser sight, and they needed a, it needed to line the laser up with the point of impact. And you and it, this thing could go up, up and down your stairs, so it could go up and down your stairs with a 12 gauge and shoot the bomb to bits. That's that's one approach. Certain bombs need that, and some bombs that will set them off if you do that. So I understand, but but um, and sniper rifles. And military and police sniper rifles we've always done a fair bit with in various parts of the world also counter what's the right word counter piracy that some ships now have to have security guards on to to counter pirates otherwise they can't get insurance so we were, we were a couple of years ago we were very busy um getting involved with that and supplying a lot of mounts for that yeah, up to 50 caliber, 50 caliber rifles for um, upsetting the pirates. Hmm. No scope creep on that. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. That's a test of that's a test of the uh, recoil. Recoil. Yeah. <laughs> it's a hell of an endorsement when your kit is being used in life and death situations. So, mo- moving back to sort of closer to home sorts of, of shooting. I know you are a shooter, Matt. Do you get to do much shooting these days? And, and what sort of shooting are you doing, if so? Yeah, um, we've got we've got chickens and, and various, um, quite a selection of, of poultry and things at home. And we get rats and, and my my wife keeps them all, really. But I, I, I have to sort of, I'm sort of chief vermin control man there and, and uh, rats. I, I quite enjoy the rats sometimes. But probably this time of year, you it's, it's so late when you can start, isn't it? You know, late at night. In, in the winter's better, really. You can go at a bit more sensible time, you know. <laughs> but the you know, I quite enjoy that, really. Um, and I do some um, game, game shooting in the winter um, on a small um, uh, pheasant syndicate. Um, and I've got... Um, and, and, and fo- you know, and centre fire and rim fire stuff as well, so... So quite a selection. I don't do as much as I'd like, really, um, but I'd like to do a bit more. But um, I'll do it when I can. I think we'd all like to do more if we could. <laughs> so what, what, what's your air rifle of choice, Matt? I've I've got um, an Air Arms Ultimate Sporter, which I really like. Yeah. Very nice. And I'm friends with Dave Wellham uh, Air Masters. He he lives just up the road from the factory and a bit long standing, and it's got one of his um, regulators in it. Not that I particularly need all that just to shoot rats at twenty yards, but you know it, it's it, it's nice to have. <laughs> I was going to say it's good to know. It's good to yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. This kit. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that that's been fascinating, Matt. What we'll do is move on to some questions that we've had from podcast uh, viewers and listeners. But before we do. I must just remind everybody to pick up a copy of Airgun World magazine. The latest one looks like that. Um, better still, take out a subscription. You can get 13 copies a year delivered to your door. Subscription includes shooting insurance, and we do actually have an offer to save money for podcast viewers and listeners. If you look at the description or visit airgun-world.com, while you're there, if you also sign up for the free Airgun World newsletter keeps you bang up to date with everything at the magazine. So, moving swiftly onwards, Rich, do you want to kick us off with the yeah? First I've got question? a couple of questions. So the first comes from Sam Ritchie, and I'm sure uh, Matt, you'll have a view on this. He wants to know um, what do we think has been the biggest leap in terms of technology in air guns and air gun accessories in the last few years. Um. The last few years, I, I suppose I'd say the, the digital day and night scopes, um, going back further, PCPs, I suppose, but they've been around for some time now, haven't they? But, but yeah, I'd, I'd probably say digital day and night scopes are a big step forward. There's particularly what, particularly the latest tube type ones where you can don't have to have the scope way way up in the air. You know, you know, you can have it in a sensible position for our um so comfortable and, and you don't have any um 
you know, holdover problems. It does seem like it's a market that barely a week goes by without some new manufacturer appearing. Yes. And yes. a new product coming out. Yeah. And, and they're, they're getting, you know, they're still not cheap, are they? But, but they're getting a lot more and more mass market prices now as well. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, other Matt? Certainly, you know, digital optics, thermal optics, and, and more recently, the incorporation of laser rangefinders and ballistic calculators. So these things are shifting your aim point for you and, and doing a lot of the, the calculations for or all of the calculations for your hold over and hold under and even compensating for the wind in certain instances. So, yeah, that's I'd say probably digital optics. In my lifetime, going back a bit further, same as Matt, I would say PCP air guns becoming more mainstream, more accessible, more affordable, more reliable. I can still remember the first time I shot a pre-charged air gun and I just could not believe how easy it was to shoot well with it. First of all, I thought it was massively under power because it was such a dead thing to shoot. It was it was an Air Arms S400 and it had the Air Arms tapered silencer on it, which was a really effective silencer. And of course, there were no moving parts like you'd get on a spring gun making a noise. So it was really quiet, didn't do anything in my shoulder. And I just thought that the gun was massively under power. Yeah, and broken. I had it zeroed in about five shots and then then, then realised that it was shooting pretty flat. And it, yeah, it absolute revelation. So, yeah, that was a big one for me. Yeah. Any others on your list, Rich? I think sort of continuing on the theme, I think thermal in terms of spotters um, for me has been the, the biggest step forward. That was a real step change for me. The first time I used one, it was a real, you know, my God moment. Um, and I, I think also, you know, on, on the, the digital IR night vision side, I think, you know, when you look at how prices have come down relative, I, I can remember, I'm, I'm sure we all used to shoot with the old night sight a uh, screen on top of the scope and a torch on top of that and, and all the rest of it. You know, when I look back, what, six, seven, eight years ago, you could spend seven, eight hundred pounds on a top of the range night sight kit. You know, now for the same money, you can buy, you know, pretty much a, a top notch uh, digital scope. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, yeah. the technology is massively advanced, but I think all of those different players coming in, um, has kept the prices down and kept the prices competitive as well. Yes, yes. But, um, so I've got another question from Alex Hall, uh, and he wants to know what is our fa- favourite time of the year for air gun hunting? It's a hard one, isn't it? Because it's, in, in the winter, it's easier to go out on the rats as you know, a sensible time rather than the middle of the night sort of thing. But may, may, maybe sort of um, springtime. Maybe springtime, yeah. Mm-hmm. How, how about you, Air Gun World, Matt? We're, we're getting there. We're getting towards it now. Actually. So I say autumn going into winter for me. I like hunting when there's a bit of a chill in the air, the leaves are down. And also, Matt alluded to it earlier on when he was talking about shooting rats around his hens. The fact that it gets dark a bit earlier or a lot earlier. Yeah. Um, like dusk is a brilliant time of day to shoot and when the days are really short you can go out shooting at dusk and be back home in time for dinner which is great um and similarly you can go out and do your night vision shooting after dinner and get back and get to bed at a half civilized time because june and july shouldn't complain because it's, it's what we enjoy doing but don't i ever feel it in the, as i get older don't i ever notice it in the mornings after a late night out so yeah for, for me I, I just think those those colder months um and also for targeting quarry we tend to do it around food sources there's less natural food around in the winter so i just i just think it's it's more productive and i think fair weather shooters are really missing a trick what, what about you rich yeah I, I i suppose i look at it at a different way and I, I i dislike shooting in very very hot weather because yeah so i guess not that we've had much but um, you know, to your point, the quarry go to ground. It's uncomfortable walking around and everything, and you have to wait forever for it to cool down. And and I think the other thing that I like about autumn and, and winter shooting is, yeah, you don't have to stay out as late, but also you don't have to get up as early. 
you know, when the, when the mornings are darker, you can get out at sort of 6.37 and catch that sort of, you know, first light hour or two of, of, of shooting. Whereas in the summer, you know, you've got to get up at three, four o'clock in the morning. And if you've been out rat shooting the night before, that means you're up, you know, all night and, and all day. But yeah, so I, I guess I would, I think there seems to be consensus there around now's the best time to get out shooting. Yes, yeah, so, so, certainly not high summer. And it, like, like you said, there's just yeah. so much time when there's not much happening between those peak times that are during really antisocial hours during the, during the summer months. Well, the next question I've got is from Paul Atkins, and he's asking, do you shoot jays when they visit your squirrel feeders? Sports match, Matt. Do you do, do any jay control? If, it, um... If there was plenty around, if you if you if if you hardly saw one, I probably wouldn't. But if you saw a few regularly, I probably would. Rich, I think we we have to be careful now, don't we? Because, um, I think it's GL forty says you can only shoot jays if they if you're conserving protected woodland bird species. Yes. Um, and I, I must admit, you know, I, I've never really shot jays that much because. I just think they're really handsome birds, and you don't see a huge amount of them. Um, I see loads of them on my on a couple of my squirrel permissions, and they're just on the peanuts endlessly. Um, but you know, as far as I'm aware, there's only one permission that I shoot on that I know has some protected woodland bird species, and I never see any jays there anyway. So I'm I'm quite happy to, to leave them alone. I know they do predate on songbirds like magpies do but i don't think the numbers at least around by me are as big as as magpies i think they let off the hook a bit partly because they're pretty though as well i can't help but think that um yeah yeah i must admit, i i don't like to make the decision on what something looks like but it it's fair to say jay is an incredibly I mean. handsome bird i i u- i used to shoot quite a few on some permissions but i can't remember the last time i shot a jay and more recently it tends to be done on a case by case basis. You speak with the landowner, try to establish what the problem is. I don't have any permission to know where jays are so abundant that they need controlling. Probably no. most of these, most of my woodland permissions probably do have red listed songbirds nesting on them, but they're doing fine. In fact, I think I've had comments on the air gun show where people have criticized me for watching jays visiting squirrel feeders and, and not shooting them. But when they're not abundant, they're not yeah. doing a heck of a lot of damage. And I think you have to also take into account jays aren't evil. But same, same with magpies. If you've only got a handful of magpies, they've got no option. They're not being murderous or cruel. If they want to live and they want their young to live, they need to eat. And, and that instinctively to them is robbing nests. And it's just all about maintaining that balance. And as Rich said, meeting those general licenses. And yes. For me, recently, the the need to control jays on my permissions just hasn't hasn't been there. Uh, the other factor for me is that I've got a mate called Dave, and everyone's got a mate called Dave. But my particular Dave, um, his granddad used to keep a jay, and I can remember as, as a kid it talking. And and I I, <laughs> I could I couldn't bring myself it'd be like be like shooting Dave's granddad if I shot a jay. <laughs> <laughs> It didn't say a lot, but it definitely said a few words. Don't shoot, mostly. <laughs> okay, well, uh, next question. So this one's come via Instagram. Do you still ever use um, scope-mounted lamp instead of infrared night vision or thermal? Matt, you've, you've been talking about rat shooting. Are, are you using fancy digital optics or are you using a scope-mounted lamp? Um, more more the, the, the fancy day-night optics now but I, there's, there's one rifle i've got where i still put a torch on top sometimes uh, you know uh, for for rats and things just for a bit of light but it's i think that you know, this is still an effective method of shooting isn't it but but most things are a bit skitchy of the light so it's just a lot easier really isn't it with with the day night it's still a, it's still a good way to go and a lot cheaper as well I can't honestly remember the last time I used a lamp on top of a rifle. I think the last time probably would have been with a Springer, 
when I was probably doing something for the magazine and, and you know, we were sort of hunting on a budget or something. Um, but I think the thing is nowadays, I knew, a, a, a lamp was always a good idea if you um, didn't want to muck around with the, the, the zero on your day scope. Um, but with the advent of IR add-ons, you know, you don't need to muck around with the zero anyway. So, yeah, it's been a long time since I've used a lamp on a, on a rifle. Yeah. How about you, man? I'm, I'm guessing you, you've done a bit of, in your time. Did loads and thought it was... Per- Same, you mentioned the night sight earlier on, and it's a similar thing. Back when I only had a scope-mounted lamp, I thought that that was like as good as it gets. Then when I got a night sight, I thought that was as good as it gets. And we, we are, we're spoiled now. We're used to this kind of lamp-free stealth. As Matt said, it's getting more affordable. It's easier to use. There are times, though, to be honest with you, when I miss the simplicity, especially if I'm using a particularly complicated new piece of night vision kit and it's taken me a while to fathom it and it's just I, I install the latest firmware, do this, that and the other. And I'm thinking, well, actually, I could just snap a lamp onto a scope. It'd be a lot simpler. But lamp free night shooting in terms of stealth, you, you just can't get close to it, can you really? It's just a, another level. I don't think any any of the day night scopes are as, are as clear as a decent scope that are they during the day you know some some are getting quite close but then it's still not quite as sharp as a, as a decent scope you know for daytime stuff so mm. there, is, there is still a compromise there i think you're right because every time i look through a, a digital scope in the day i think wow that's really clear that's getting close to glass and then i go use a, use a glass scope and i realize no it's not mm, yeah you know, glass has still got the, as you say, the gap is getting smaller, but mm. it's still there. Mm. That's right. I think it's it's the features and function that are making people choose digital optics for day shooting. Obviously, we mentioned the range finders, ballistic calculators, the ability to record directly through them. But yeah, good, good glass is still still in a in a different league. Getting close to the end now, um, Matt. Very quickly, what? is your desert island air gun if you could just use one air gun for the rest of your days what would it be i think it would be my my um air arms ultimate sporter because i I do really like it yeah yeah i do really like it not the gc2 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 is because it was designed primarily for field targets you you push the rear button in um to cock the gun put the pellet in and then there's, a, there's a, another button on the side um, that was like, was like a safety, and, and that cut that cut the air off to the valve. And it was it's quite a loud click, and, and um, so it was not brilliant for hunting in that respect. And it was quite a loud click that can make things run away and look up. So for, that, that's probably the reason <laughs> I don't use that more. That's that's brilliant. Well, look, thank you, Matt, ever so much for your time and your insight. Thank you, Rich. I need to say thanks again to the podcast sponsor, Crackshot. They're based in Newton Abbott, or you can check out their website, which is crackshot.uk. They're also on Facebook. Again, don't forget to have a look at those subscription offers for Airgun World magazine, which include shooting insurance. There's a link in the description or visit airgun-world.com. The Airgun World podcast will be back in a fortnight. Thank you for tuning in. (laughs) 